Hello there ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to the Common Sense Guys channel. How are you all doing today? My name's Jason. You probably read the title of the video before clicking onto it, but if you haven't, this video is going to be about the police and crime bill that the Conservatives are trying to push through and Labour are trying to oppose. Now, in my personal opinion, I think Labour doing this is doing this for the right reasons, though they are doing it for political reasons more than actually standing up for rights. But my point is I don't see too many right-wing people that are so abundant for free speech pointing out the fact that in this crime bill, if a police officer finds you annoying, just annoying, that's the legal language that's being used in this bill, they can arrest you and put you under for a 10-year sentence or fine you £2,500 just because they find you annoying. Let alone the point of you may be too loud and be fined or arrested as well. But I don't see too many right-wing pundits, so to speak, actually talking about this issue and trying to skirt it. Because apparently Labour can't do anything right, because if they do do something right, it makes them look better than the Conservatives, rather than upholding their principles that they're supposed to hold. So now that I've given this a massive stab in the eye for people that watch me overall, I'm hoping that I can convince a couple of people that we do need to stand up against this, and I know this is coming out on a Friday, but I do think that it needs to be talked about. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let's actually get into what the main reasons are for this bill, and let's get into the actual idea of what the bill actually says. Let's get into it, shall we? So, what is the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill and how will it change protests? And I think this is a very interesting question. And let's have a look to see how it's actually posed, shall we? So, obviously, I have done a video about Sarah Everard's vigil. Uh, that was yesterday. If you haven't watched it, I will link it into a card that will pop up in the top corner now. If not, I will also link it down in the description box for you. So if you wanted to watch it, it is a long video, but it is a video worth watching. So what, what are powers do the police have now? So if the police want to place restrictions on a protest, they generally have to show it may result in serious public disorder, serious damage to property, or serious disruption to life of the community. So, you know, all legal stuff there that has to be proven, they have to come out and they have to prove it right, they have to prove their case. So there has to be specific measures that are in route, and they have to be roadmapped and shown why this is going on, right? So actual reasons. So this obviously comes as well with uh, major events normally have to apply for these types of uh, processes or processes. It normally can't be just a spontaneous thing. Normally it's weeks, sometimes it can be days. Uh, sometimes it can be thrushed out in a day depending on what happens, uh, goes through courts and police and so on and so forth. It can be thrashed out, but generally it's normally organized within weeks. So let's have a look about how the bill is going to be changed, shall we? So, police chiefs will be able to put more conditions on static protests. They will be able to impose a start and a finish time. Now, that in itself doesn't sound too bad, for instance. It doesn't sound too bad. But put it this way. Say that they only put it for an hour for people to walk down outside of Parliament Square, for instance, to make sure the traffic can walk through and go through and so on and so forth, rather than it being an all-day thing. If the police are the ones that are setting the time, how is it that they're going to be able to enforce the, the time as well without more draconian measures being put into place? It should be an actual time that's agreed upon with the protesters and with the police. It shouldn't be imposed upon the protesters. Yet, yeah, you could argue that there does need to be an overall 
finish time, like say they wanted to start at 12 and the overall finish time for everybody to go home is 9 or 10, that's probably a good thing. But that isn't what this states. It's saying that the police chiefs get to impose a start and a finish time. So they could say, well, what you can do is you can start at 7, knowing that nobody's going to get there for that time and you finish at 12, knowing that that's not really going to be doing anything. You want an all-day thing if you're going to do a protest. Next, moving on, sorry. Uh, going to be a longish video again, I can feel it. So it also sets noise limits. So again, I was saying in the introduction that it could be a case of somebody that was using a bullhorn or a microphone to be able to talk. That could be over a noise limit that has been set by the police. And if something like that is happening, they can arrest the people that have breached and set noise limits. This isn't a case of, oh, well, it's going to go over noise pollution. No, it's a case of they get to set the noise limits. So if you're chanting too loudly, you can't actually, you may be arrested for it. That in itself is a scary goddamn thought, is it not? So apply these rules to a demonstration by just one person. So that means if one person that's part of the organisers goes in and is implemented and told what is going on and what limits are in force, if you, somebody separate, goes into this protest and doesn't know what is actually going on and what the rules are, what the limits are, you've got your bullhorn and you start, you know, <laughs> saying what you want to say, so to speak, with the bullhorn, it's a case of if the noise limits have been set so that you can't use bullhorns and that one person of the organiser knows that it's not allowed and then doesn't tell you or doesn't give enough time to let you know that that's something that's happened, you're now liable for everything because somebody was told. So you, they don't have to actually give out the whole information to everybody for that. It's just a case if they tell one person, then it applies to everybody. So let's read a couple of other things that are not implicitly stated in those three bullet points. So if you go to the second point where it states if they refuse, if they refuse to follow police directions over how they should conduct their protest, they could be fined up to 2,500. Remember that the police directions only need to be told to one person, the organisers, so on and so forth. But if you as somebody else is not a part of the organising team or just turned up and you have breach some of the rules, so to speak, that you don't know have changed or have been implicitly put into this one protest rather than universal protest laws, you can get fined for that. So again, if they said you can't use bullhorns and you turn up and we use a bullhorn, you can be fined £2,500 for breaching noise limits or staying longer than the finish time says. And all that needs to be told is just one person. That's it. So, it will also become a crime to fail to follow restrictions the protesters ought to have known about, even if they have not received a direct order from an officer. So again, if one person knows all of these restrictions or the restrictions have been put forward and you turn up not knowing what the actual restrictions are, you ought to know what the laws are, you ought to know what the restrictions are before you turn up, even if you haven't been received or directed order by a police officer, you are still liable for the 2,500 fine and you're also liable for breaking rules and laws. So if you turn up and you've broken one of the restrictions without even knowing it, you can be arrested and taken to prison for it. Remember, this is Laws and restrictions that are just imposed by the police. Not thrashed out, not decided upon, imposed. Jacronally imposed what you can do. So at present, police need to prove protesters knew they have been told to move on before they can be said to have broken the law. My actual point exactly. If you stayed a bit longer because everybody started to go home, but you were saying, well, I want to stay because I'm not sure what the time is for finishing. I still think we've got more to do today. Then you can be arrested, thrown in prison, or you can have a 2,500 fine for just going, well, I didn't know. Because apparently you ought to know.
To me, that's a breach of human rights, especially with the right of protesting. But that's just me, right? So the proposed law includes an offence of intentionally or recklessly causing public nuisance. This is designed to stop people occupying public spaces, hanging off bridges, gluing themselves to windows or employing other protest tactics to make themselves both seen and heard. Now, in practice, I agree with the law, but in implementation, it's still a breach of human rights. Because if I want to try and block off roads to make sure that we get an actual point across in this option or this law, you won't be able to do that because that's occupying a public space. If you want to stop trains from being able to go through or buses or whatever because you want to make a point about green energy or something like that, you can't do that. If you wanted to try and protest out of a court to stop people being prosecuted for infringements, for instance, or because you think your favourite right-wing activist is being arrested for no apparent reason, you're not allowed to do that anymore because you're occupying public spaces. So this law is so ambiguous in how it would actually be implemented that it's a, it can be used as a breach of human rights for any form of protest that's in the public eye or in the public space. And I find that draconian as hell. Uh, the other is to do with uh, statues and uh, things like that, which I think is an important thing that you shouldn't go around damaging people's property or public property. So I kind of agree with that. I don't agree with the 10-year sentencing, though, though I think that that's to do with a maximum rather than a minimum. But... Again, I think that overall, the whole bill itself needs to be scrapped and started again, simply because it completely and utterly destroys the right to protest. Completely and utterly destroys the right to protest. So, a lot of ministers think that this needs to change because of how Extinction Rebellion uh, conducted themselves during the 2019 mass uh, protests that were over everywhere. And... I can understand why they would want to put laws into place, but that's the point of protests. If you have enough people that follow and want to make this something that they're um, aggrieved about, they have every right to protest it. Just because you disagree with necessarily the actual message, the right to protest is supposed to be sacrosanct, especially in a democracy, unless you don't believe in democracies. Which is one of the things that I'm very interested in and why right-wing pundits don't seem to be actually talking about it. Because do they agree with censoring people that are allowed to protest and not realising that it affects them as well if they want to protest? So ladies and gentlemen, and however you may identify, this is the main reason why I really wanted to do this video and why I wanted to talk about this bill. There are some interesting laws that are in there that may be useful overall. Uh, for instance, the idea of harsher sentencing and so on and so forth for uh, criminals. Um, the idea that because women's not mentioned in the bill that it doesn't implicitly actually help women and how laws that are affecting or stopping rape from going forward, for instance, are now going to be intrinsically longer because now that they're going to make sure that harsher punishments are dealt out for harsher crimes, that's probably a good thing overall, but there's lots of bad in here. Uh, I mean, really bad stuff in here. As I said before, you have the idea of if a police officer now doesn't have to implicitly tell you that what you're doing is wrong before he can arrest you, put you into prison for breaching the restrictions, fining you 2500 they can set noise limits on you so that you can't protest or cheer. So that, again, in itself means that they're now controlling what you're allowed to say and how you say it. That by itself should be enough for anybody that's for free speech to oppose this bill. Then you have the actual point of occupying open space or public space. That, because it's so erroneous, so ambiguous in its term, is to a point of, well, what defines public space? Is it courtrooms? Is it a case of outside public transport? Is it a case of roads? Is it a case of, what is public space now? And because that it's so ambiguous in its terminology, how is it that you could then say, well, you're not allowed to protest in public spaces if we say so, and we don't say so. 
So that in itself will stop people from being able to protest. Now, you may think, oh, well, that will stop the left from protesting. Or if you're of the other uh, persuasion, oh, that will stop the right from protesting. Just think that the whole idea of protesting is to be able to, if you have enough people that agree with your ideology, with the gripe that you have, so to speak, or the issues that you want to raise up to government, for instance, let's say... Um, the war that uh, we had in Iraq to do with Tony Blair. Imagine if this legislation was put into place to stop people that were able to protest outside of the House of Commons. Remember, Blair actually put it in place so they couldn't actually do that. Imagine if he actually had this law enshrined to be able to force people not even to turn up outside of the House of Commons if he so choose. Because it was a public space, it was deemed a hazard because of traffic, and they, it would be a security risk because of it being so close to the House of Commons. Do you see how me, myself, can work out how I can actually ban people from protesting in the area in which they want to protest? As easy as that. And I use Blair as a point, not because it's a case of I'm against Labour, I'm just against that point overall. That I don't think any government should be able to dictate when, where and how you protest. Sure, there are ways in which the restrictions should be put into place. Make sure that there can be traffic uh, traffic points so that they can go around. Sure, I completely utterly understand that, that it needs to be put down into advance. Also as well, you shouldn't go around busting people's places, uh, doing cars, so on and so forth. I get that. But this isn't just about that. The whole bill in itself isn't just about that. It, to me, mostly goes to the point of restricting people from being able to protest. And because of the ambiguousness of the language, can be used against anybody at any time for any reason. And for me, I'm against that. Now ask yourself a question. Are you against that? If you are against that, then share this video, let people know what's going on, and try and put pressure on your local MPs and write to them to say that we do not agree with this. Vote against it. That's Conservative, Lib Dem, Labour. Do what you can to stop this bill from passing through. And that's not because I've said so. But if you're for the idea of being able to protest, the idea of free speech, free expression, then you should be against it. Not because the Conservatives put it forward. Not because Labour are opposing it. But because you offer free speech. No other reason. Now, with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, I bid you farewell, I bid you adieu, take care, and I'll see you all again real soon. Bye-bye for now.